I'm writing a book at the moment on sector robots that Stuart publishes in two weeks. So in a way, this is a talk. But it's a sorry. It's from extracts from the book as well. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Just try the theatre of life. <laughs> Scene one, act one. <laughs> um, so this is this is quite a long talk, and I think I will, um, depending on what I feel the reaction is in the audience, depend whether to read all of it or just. Because I, th I think there's a lot of issues that um, people in the room would like to contribute to. And I think if you're going to be involved in, in working with others, it's important that we make space so that people in the audience get an opportunity to participate in the discussion as well. So I'll do my best. <clears throat> I would welcome the sex robots. I don't see any negative implications and the positives outweigh any concerns. Sex robots would provide a safe for many, a safe release for many, and would reduce incidents of rape, child abuse, prostitution, sexually transmitted diseases, abortions, and the nasty side effects of the sex trade. That was one of the many, many hundreds and hundreds of comments that were sent to me at the campaign against sex robots. So let us begin. At the time of writing this book, there's seven and a half billion people in the world. Of the seven billion, 325 million are living in the United States, 126 million in Japan, and 65 million in the United Kingdom. And yet, despite all the opportunities that we now have for the first time ever in history for more human interaction, in some countries of the world, Adults are retreating from entering into intimate relationships with each other. Enter the new field of social and sex robots and AI bots for lonely humans. Artificial entities that will be your substitute relationship, including but not limited to your sexual relationship, even a loving relationship. Robots and AI are now marketed as girlfriends and some future experts predict that the law will change to permit the marriage of robots and humans. One such advocate, David Levy, in his talk, Why Not Marry a Robot, has presented a case for robot marriage, saying that if it was once restricted between people of colour and same-sex relationships, then why not for robots? Advocates of robots frequently appropriate narratives of history of oppression, including women, homosexuals, and racial discrimination and present these arguments as claims for the rights and recognitions of machines. There are many people who advocate for the positive benefits of sex dolls, and these include lifelike dolls and robots will offer companionship to lonely men and women. Men desire sex differently from women. And this will mean that men are able to get their needs met without resorting to human women or children or whatever they need to get their needs met from. Sex robots will reduce prostitution. They'll reduce child rape. It will add a new addition to sex, you know, make it more interesting, another, another thing on the menu. In many ways, there are no sex robots in any real sense. What there are are dolls. And some of these doll manufacturers, such as Mac McMullen, or real dolls, are exper experimenting with introducing AI, voice and speech recognition systems into their robots, into their dolls. In 2017, a Barcelona-based engineer, Sergei Santos, developed a doll named Samantha that is equipped with several sensors in the body, such as a waist which activates speech when pressed by a user. Convincing adults to buy a sex doll is difficult, but in a time when robots and AI are part of our lives or imagined future, and we're all fascinated with all things technological, the idea that this could be an alternative set in this framework is just a matter of time. There's Sergey and Samantha. <clears throat> Films such as Her and Ex Machina and TV programs like Westworld and Humans have popularized the idea 
that sex robots and relational partners are not limited to other humans. But when the creators of Westworld wanted to use robots in their drama, did they call up Sanjo, uh, Sergei or Mac McMullen? No. They used human actors to play the roles of robots in their dramas. In the dramas of Westworld, Ex Machina and Humans, humans, robots are played by human actors. In Westworld, the prostituted robots in the Wild West brothels were played by human actors. In the film Her, the directors likewise did not contact the makers of chatbots or AI assistants such as Google. The products will perform in the role of Samantha. The makers of Her use the voice of the actress Scarlett Johansson to play the role of the virtual AI being. We have to understand that in order for the makers of Her and Westworld and Humans to convince people that something was possible, they didn't use any robots at all, in fact. What they used were human beings and imaginary that already exist in our lived realities of human beings. Not even just imaginary, it's real. So the makers had to create a fantasy by transforming the human women in their dramas into robots and AI virtual girlfriends, and then representing these AI and virtual girlfriends back to us as technological objects. We might refer here to the feminist film critic, Laura McMulvey, who coined the term the male gaze to describe a one-sided perspective so that woman, whether she is a human or a robot, is what the male wants her to be. Of course, in fiction, we can create endless images of women that are constructions of the male gaze that do not relate to the lived realities of women as human beings. <clears throat> the fictional world of robots and AI acts as the canvas which any number of projections can be created without the need for any reference to reality. On the canvas or in the digital artifact, um, science fiction can offer a view of robots in an AI that is detached from technological developments. This doesn't mean that fiction is unimportant, and what can be revealed from exploring fiction is not the truth, but the truth about perception and desire. In order to buy into the idea of sex dolls, sex robots, and AI virtual girlfriends, significant modifications to reality have to be enacted. It is a retreat from the reality that I'm going to talk about in this presentation. So what is a, a definition of a robot? There are quite a lot around, but this one's an OED definition. A machine with a human appearance or functioning like a machine. A machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically. A person who works mechanically and, efficient, and efficiently, but insensitively. So any number of ways then you can kind of imagine a robot. <clears throat> Given above, real dolls wouldn't really count as a robot at all. But these times they are changing. And what counts as a robot these days, what counts as AI, is less defined than ever before. Artificial intelligence is a field that's related to robots, at least in the current era. But they can often be separate. So you can talk about AI without robotics and robotics with AI, and sometimes both together. Traditionally, AI grew out of computing and militarism. The early AI project, um, initiated after the 1956 Dartmouth Conference, focused on creating human-like intelligence. AI might include learning, reasoning, perception, language understanding, or problem solving. Any one of these areas, or several of them combined, could count as artificial intelligence. Since the heyday of AI in the 50s and 60s, by the 70s and 1980s, many critics of AI had thought it had run its course. Funding to AI departments was downsized in the 80s, and the original goals of the AI researchers were increasingly uh, reduced. So they became less focused on reproducing strong AI or this replicated human being, and more on particular kinds of tasks that humans do, that humans do. <clears throat> By 2000, 
By the 1970s, for example, researchers found that machines could not be programmed to navigate through spaces using only logical mathematical formulas. Human reasoning could not be reduced to a mathematical formula. The AI machines could not respond to unpredictable environments. These difficulties are actually still the same today, but something new has reinvigorated artificial intelligence. The internet and the corporate use of personal data. Algorithms based on big data sets, based on collecting mathematical data on how people click, spend time on websites, move from one website to another, what kind of purchases we have, uh, what kind of hobbies, and communicate the contents of our communications. All these things now have what has invigorated AI. What has revolutionized AI is not overcoming the original problems by stimulate, simulating human-like intelligence, but the move online and the automation of banking, education, healthcare, social networking, commerce. All these moves online create the, what documentary maker Adam Curtis called a two-way mirror, which with corporations and organizations now able to gain access to personal information and target products. Um, but the shift in the rise of social networking and marketing should be renamed, should actually mean that artificial intelligence has to be renamed advertising intelligence because that's really what it is. In many ways, virtual AI bots are easier to produce than robots. Companies that produce AI avatars don't have to engage with the complexity of trying to engineer a physical body producing an animation. And I can't draw, so that's, I mean, that's still difficult. <laughs> many people who use computers have mastered writing and pushing buttons, which means that these are the basic skills necessary to control a computer quite different from what might be required to control a complex uh, engineered robot. <clears throat> Robots, by contrast, are physical agents, and engineering a human to perform in human-like ways is a complex task, as any robotic scientist will tell you. Macmullen of Real Dolls began with producing dolls, and then, in turn, adding bits of tech to these dolls. <clears throat> The links between new media and the sex and the commercial sex trade in pornography, prostitution, and child exploitation are well known. The commercial sex trade has impacted on the development of cable and pay TV, high cost phone lines, the internet, CD ROMs, laser discs, and video formatting, to name a few. And there was obviously the great debate around VHS and Betamax in the 1980s. <laughs> Advocates of this technology believe that these sex robots and AI bots will have little impact on human relationships and human society. Even as I've just said, some arguing that they will be absolutely beneficial. In the labs of real dolls, <clears throat> a visitor will see representations of women's bodies hanging from hooks like in an abattoir. The abattoir of the sex doll robot features silicone bodies broken up into parts. Heads in one basket, vaginas in another, breasts in another. All these disconnected body parts make up the primary idea of the artificial woman. And then that is sold back to us as a doll to its customers. Real, Real Doll advertised the choice of three male dolls on the site, including Michael. And this is the description of Michael. Body, B, skin tone, tanned, eye color, blue, wig color and, and style not available, facial, facial hair, clean shaven, penis size, medium, um, pubic hair, shaven, outfit, not available. <laughs> you can choose from a selection of eye colors, pubic hair colors, facial hair, penis size, um, for Michael and other dolls. But female dolls are advertised a bit differently. Let's look at a, a description of a hybrid doll. Forehead design with deep mouth insert, non-removable, advanced weight reduction throughout body, new pelvic insert design, removable orifice system, vaginal and head, patent pending, medical grade addition pure silicon, fixed anal orifice, soft platinum 
grade silicon insert orifice material. Improved breast feel and internal anatomy. In real doll promotions, there are strong similarities between the way that the dolls are marketed on their websites and how women bodies are marketed in prostitution. On this website below, this was just, you can go online and find this in any city of the world, but any village, um, uh, a site like this. This is just one I found in Leicester. Isabel, early 30s, big brown eyes, pouting lips, dark hair, 5'6", with a 36E bust and size 10, 12 figure. Sin Simone, absolutely stunning, 5'4", with big brown eyes, short black hair, tandem tone, size 8 and 10, with 34 double D bust. Um, as the woman's body in prostitution is rented out as merchandise, the features of women are reduced to their proportions. Attributes of women's and dolls emphasize their chest, their waist, um, their appearance. As in the workshops and the basements of the makers of robotic dolls, their bodies are broken up into parts akin to the representation of female bodies in pornography. With anti-pornography activist Andrew Dworkin writing, Pornography says that women are sluts, cunts. Pornography shows women's bodies as parts, as genitals, as vaginal slips, as nipples, as buttocks, as lips, as open wounds, as pieces. Pornography uses real women. Pornography is an industry that buys and sells women. Pornography sets the standard for female sexuality. Dawkins was writing about this, about porn, which she could have actually been writing about sex dolls and sex robots. The robotic and AI substitute that has been marketed over the last 20 years was first in small research labs in the US, Japan, UK. But now more widely, the idea that we can have relationships with robotics, with robots and AI bots as substitute for human relationships so in a way, this kind of ground has been laid, actually, even before we got to sex dolls and sex robots. The ground had already been laid by the most vulnerable communities being targeted for these robots, particularly the elderly. I won't go into that, but I kind of feel that, um, that these are issues that need to be addressed quite seriously. <clears throat> so... There are more sex dolls and robots that are built of women and girls than men and boys. Not that I want to encourage some of gender equality in sex dolls. Um, and after, after like, hearing my presentation and reading the book that's going to come out this year, I hope you will agree with me that what's happening is something that we need to start doing something about. But there is something that marks off the treatment of women and girls from men and boys, and that is the political treatment of women and girls as forms of property, to be used as objects rather than related to as co-humans. Whatever can be said about what is promoted by the advocates of sex dolls and robots and bots, it is not relationships with others. It's not relating to others, but using others like tools. So at the core of the argument I present here to you, is rooted in narratives of anti-slavery. It's rooted in, in the rejection that people should be looked upon or treated as tools and forms of property. The position that I write is informed by abolitionist feminism, a theory rooted in the rejection that women are property, particularly sexual property. But judging from the support of some men for real dolls and the future of animatronic dolls, Perhaps Matt, perhaps Matt Mullen has hit on something about how men, some men, view sexuality today. That these kind of dolls are a preferred alternative to a relationship with a real live human being, a real live human being woman. This is one um, example of another message that was sent to me. Scared your limited control over men will be finally lost. The last vestige of female usefulness might be eliminated. Then what will women do, gasp, have to earn a living? <clears throat> so, this is, if you, there are, there's lots more than that. So In countries of the world where respect for women's equality, to choose a husband or her relationships and enter into sexual relationships or other kinds of relationships outside of marriage, um, 
for our own uh, gratification and pleasure is an important milestone in the history of human development. For centuries, women were the property of men passed from father to husband in a series of slave-like relations. Women were prevented from owning property and from participating at all in political life. In the UK, women achieved the right to vote in the Representation of the People Act in 1918. But this was only for women over the age of 30. It was not until 1928 that suffrage, that woman suffrage, was extended to all women over the age of 21. The reform of laws um, gave men explicit claims on women have slowly been rejected over the last hundred years and well before then, but we've really, um, women have gained uh, considerable rights over the last uh, 60, 70 years. In 1991, for example, marriage, protect, the marriage laws protected men from charges of rape. Back on marriage law, a woman's obligation to provide sex for her husband uh, was implicated in marriage, so it was not possible to rape her. Moreover, the strict emphasis on virginity and purity around women's sexuality was all also tied to the idea of a woman being owned by men, and, has his, and has, as his property could not be violated by another. The rights of women to make choices about her partners and her sexual engagement marks an important stage in women's equality. This is now articulated through a discussion of consent and no mean no, no campaigns. Dorking and McKinnon were among the earliest feminist writers who began to show how women were subjected to practices in the commercial sex trade that were a violation of their rights as women. And they wrote, women's human rights are violated through sexual exploitation uh, and abuse. Rape, battery, incest, prostitution, and sexualized murder express contempt for the human worth of women and keep women of second class. The violations they describe are not only the extreme forms of torture and murder that are illegal um, in US and European criminal codes, but the torture that they're talking about is integral to what you will see in pornography. Criminal laws exist against rape, battery, assault, kidnapping, sexual molestation of children, and many other acts that are standard practice in pornography, they write. Feminist critics drew attention to the fact that the history of sexuality was derived from a male view of what sex was. The critical perspectives of sex came out of feminist critiques of marriage arrangements that favoured male needs, desires and wants, <coughs> and created and sustained industries of prostitution, pornography and child abuse. And I would add male order brides um, and other, other kind of commercial offshoots of, this, of the sex trade. What Dawking and other feminists did was to narrate, narrate an alternative history of sexuality. One in which rape um, uh, emphasized, was emphasized continually in the sexual relations between men and women. Rape culture was first coined in the 70s by a second wave feminist. Let us explore this issue in another way. <laughs> Sex is a co-experience involving two or more parties. Sex, by definition, is a co-experience. It involves an I and a you. Um, uh, when, you're, when, you're kind of, when you're involved in an activity with another human being, they are not, not present. They actually are present. Cast is an act of violence against the human. It is an act that annihilates the I and the you. Rape, by contrast, uh, sorry, it is an act that annihilates the I and the you and between humans. In fact, rape really characterizes the idea of the Cartesian I. I think, therefore I am. The Cartesian I really emphasizes the I perspective over any other perspective. The definition of a, I think I missed the page. <laughs> oh, so the I perspective. So if we think about something that um, 
is integral to an IU perspective, we might consider empathy, because empathy is about taking into account what another person might be thinking, feeling, and experiencing. And this, uh, an expert in the UK, Baron Cohen, had this to say, empathy is without question an important ability. It allows us to tune into someone, what someone else is feeling and what they might be thinking. Empathy allows us to understand the intentions of others and predict their behavior and experience uh, triggered by their emotion. In short, empathy allows us to inter interact effectively in the social world. It also is the glue of the social world, drawing us to help others and stopping us from hurting others. Presenting sex as a co-experience is a challenge to commercial sex trade practices because it rests on the assumption, those practices, that what happens to the bodies of women and girls is less important than the, than the gratification that men and boys receive from them, mostly men. This is also the case of young men and boys who are also victims of the commercial sex trade. What I want to go on to now is think about some kind of uh, uh, a way of making sense of all this in terms of how we've got into the point of thinking about certain people can become forms of property. So what I'm going to argue now is what is reproduced in the commercial sex trade is an echo of the master-slave relationship, a relation characterized by two interlocking features, the representation of a human who is a tool, an animate tool, and the idea of non-mutuality. The definition of the slave that I draw upon is used in the book, The Politics, by the famous Aristotle, the celebrated philosopher who advocated and rationalized slavery in his own time and founded virtue ethics, a moral, a moral ethical guide for men. So what he wrote was, this is a short version of it, but tools may be animate as well as inanimate. For instance, a ship's rudder uses a lifeless rudder but a living man for watch. For a servant is from the point of view of his craft, characterized as one of his tools. So any piece of property can be regarded as a tool, enabling a man to live. And his property is an assemblage of such tools. A slave is a sort of living piece of property, and like any other tool, and like any other servant is a, is a tool in charge of other tools. There is some important connections to be made between Aristotle's views of slaves as animal tools and the robot character created by the playwright Carol Chapek in the 20s. In his play, Rossum's Universal Robots, robots, artificial beings, are made to take the place of the workers. But what inspired Chapek to invent the robot? In 1908, Chapek wrote a short story called The System. In this system, there is a character called John Andrew Repatrion who speaks on behalf of the manufacturing class he represents. This is his vision of the labor process, as articulated by Chapek. The labor question is holding us back. The workers must become a machine so that he can simply rotate like a wheel. A, wheel. a worker's soul is not a machine, therefore it must be removed. This is my system. I have sterilized the worker, purified him. I have destroyed in him all his feelings of altruism and camaraderie, all familial, poetic, and transcendental feeling. Repatrian wants his workers to do exactly as he wants, to never protest or show distaste for any work. He fantasizes about what it would be like to have pure control over a worker. This is the inspirational backdrop to the robot. The origin story of the robot is about taking out the human and creating an artificial entity that can be controlled. If the capitalist exploitation of workers was the backdrop to the origin story of robots, what is the origin story of AI? And we'll find that to be more disturbing. Because like Chapak's capitalist, Aristotle also had a similar fantasy uh, 2,500 years earlier. So he says, for suppose every tool perform its task, either at bidding or itself perceiving the need, then master craftsman 
would have no need of servants nor masters of slaves. Humans are not property though, and the struggle and resistance to oppression and to slavery and the desire for self-determination has got in the way of being fully controllable. Note that in Aristotle's fantasy, he does not propose to end slavery. He says there will no, be no need of masters of slaves. He does not say there will be no need of, of masters. Um, so he wants the slavery to continue, but he wants the fantasy as it continues with these new animate uh, artificial beings. Where the animate tool is merged with the inanimate tool an artificial tool that can do bidding. While Capac, while Chapac wrote, wrote about fictional characters, Aristotle was referring to living, breathing human beings. What is more disturbing is that Aristotle is associated with virtue ethics, the study of good character and moral responsibility. So if we start from the assumption that human beings are not property, and that systems that enable humans to be treated as property are problematic. We come full circle to the commercial sex trade again, operating not in secrecy, but openly in the cities of Amsterdam and Stuttgart, cities that have legalized prostitution. As the sex that is bought from the person is located inside the body, what is exchanged, rented and sold in prostitution is the human. Humans do not exist outside of their bodies. No one in this room exists outside of your body. It's not possible. Now we, need, we manage to live in systems where permanently or temporarily we can turn our bodies into forms of property and make them alienable players. Sex dolls, sex robots and AI virtual girlfriends are the offspring of the commercial sex trade, which includes prostitution, pornography, child exploitation and rare order rides. And in my forthcoming book, I write a bit about mail order brides, which <clears throat> I think is disturbing in itself. So this is the asymmetrical relationship that I described in a paper that launched this campaign, the campaign against sex robots. And there are certain things that I believe that sex robots, if they're accepted and introduced more widely, um, because they're already inside practices which are harmful to human beings, they will perpetuate and reproduce dangerous myths about women and girls as objects as of sexual gratification. They will perpetuate myths about men and boys as detached human beings, leading to harmful behaviors towards women, girls, men and boys. They will isolate human beings further and destroy the capacity to build meaningful relationships. And they will perpetuate a myth that humans are not different from property robots and AI, and that humans are interchangeable with property. <clears throat> so in the 2015, I launched this campaign, which I saw was another addition to the already bloated uh, sex trade, which to give you some idea of how uh, enormous this commercial trade is, uh, roughly, I mean, obviously, this is a notoriously difficult area to study. There are between 40 and 42 million prostitute persons in the world. Um, over 80% of them are female, and three quarters of, eight of them are aged between 13 and 25. The experience is not a co experience, but an asymmetrical relationship. The body, the buyer of the body, sometimes called a John, uh, sometimes called a punter, gets to have his needs and wants and desires met through the use of the body of another that only over 99% of buyers of human bodies in the sex trade are men. So I want, you to, I want you to think about that. I mean, that is an extraordinary figure, that we have a, a highly gendered system where one class of humans is allowed to rent, buy, and trade from the bodies of others for their own personal gratification. <clears throat> So after, after the campaign was launched, the issues in the campaign went global. And I was uh, asked to do lots of talks and present the ideas in the campaign to different audiences. Immediately, people began to say, this is a feminist campaign. You know, this is just another feminist, anti-pornography, anti-prostitution campaign. And I am all those things. 
but um, <clears throat> but for different reasons, but we'll get there in a minute. Why I launched the campaign was since 2001, I've been studying the development of social robots. And I went to do my field work in labs at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where they were developing social robots. And it was here that I first came across the idea that you could have a relationship with a machine. Um, and then after that time, I began to look at the development of uh, robots for children with autism. And inside the idea that robots could be uh, good for children with autism was this idea about masculinity as it happens. <clears throat> so one of the ideas that were very relevant to autism was this idea that men are, are unable and have difficulty developing empathetic relationships with others. And if you think about autism as an extreme male brain, masculinity is on that continuum, somewhere over that extreme, while women are empathetic and emotional on this other end. So this kind of gendered idea of men as systematizing, as asocial, as non-empathetic, was not my idea. It belonged to a right uh, autism expert called Simon Baron Cohen, who wrote in his book, A Zero, Zero Degrees of Empathy, A New Theory of Human Cruelty and Kindness. And in the book, Baron Cohen argues that men essentially are different from women in their maleness, and that men can, through some, you know, some fantasy, exist outside of humans' relations with others. So my early work explored this dangerous idea that men are somehow non-social, non-empathetic, and can exist outside of relationship. It is as much about challenging ideas about men and boys as it is about challenging ideas about women and girls. <clears throat> so to make more sense of this, I'm going to go to that one, and then we'll go back to that one. <laughs> we have to start with this idea of God the Creator. So the God of Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition created without woman, somehow autonomously this being was permitted to create the universe and everything in it, including man. <clears throat> God created Adam in his own image, so Adam has some connection with this creator. But God didn't have a female, he has no other, um, he has no other to make with, so he's created him himself. And woman, she's created out of a rib of Adam, so she's not even a whole human being, she's not even like created in the image of the creator, she's just a part of man you know, a very insignificant part of him. <clears throat> so this idea of God the Creator is very much intimate, intimately connected with this idea that humans are artifacts. Because God created the first artifacts, didn't he, when he created man. And then men were then able to create other artifacts out of their own image. <clears throat> and this is continued in other myths that we have about our origin stories that somehow we can live in worlds with creation outside of human relations, that somehow this is possible, this, this narrative. In this picture, there are no other, you know, there are no other, um, and I mean, as a minimum, in order to create anybody, you need a male and a female, right? <clears throat> so this kind of idea of the human being as an artifact, and man himself can create artifacts, idea that I'm really, really trying to challenge through the campaign and the work that I produce. Because it comes from this idea that human beings are not, well, not all, all um, members of the human species are human beings, and that we are then permitted to not relate to all human members of the human species as human beings. In fact, we can treat some of them like they were tools. And Hobbes wrote about this, in fact. So, um, he said, let us make man pronounce God in the creation. To describe the nature of this artificial man I will consider, first the matter thereof, and the artificer, both which is man. So this kind of narrative that we are artifacts, created by artifacts, going on to produce other kinds of artifacts, is based on this kind of idea of an asymmetrical relationship 
that somehow you can have a system outside of relationship. And you can have a system outside of relationship. It's called slavery. It's called colonialism. It's called militarism. You can have all those systems outside of relationship. <clears throat> so if there are two, how are we doing for time? Am I doing okay? Okay. So now I want to situate this in two ways of understanding our world today. Now we can go back to Pam Branch. <laughs> so I think there are two main ways in which we're trying to understand the human today <clears throat> in, in the neoliberal consumerist economies, such as Japan, the UK, the USA. I mean, I'm, I'm focusing here on societies that are specifically focused around the introduction and development of robots and AI. <clears throat> The first way is to believe that the human is an individual, disconnected and separate from others, coming into relationship with others only through contracts which are consented. And it was Margaret Thatcher, a British Prime Minister, who famously proclaimed, there is no such thing as society, only men, women, and individuals. She argued this as she enacted a series of reforms that withdrew state support to society and increase the political power of neoliberal elites and institutions, banks and corporations, privatize the, uh, the entire country, more or less. So this idea of the individual, and I'm talking about the enlightenment individual here, <clears throat> this starts from the assumption that humans are autonomous rather than interdependent with others and in relationship, co-relationship with others. So to understand the sex robot phenomenon, um, if you really want to understand it, you have to get the work of someone like Anne Rand, who really captures this spirit very well. And she developed a theory called objectivism. Because Rand um, supported the idea of individualism. She was an advocate of it. <clears throat> and she attacked the idea of altruism, which was about the sacrifice of the self but for others. And she wrote some of these ideas in a book that she called The Virtue of Selfishness, a New Concept of Egoism. Here she writes, the basic social principle of objectivist ethics is that just as life is an end in itself, so every living being is an end in itself. Not the means to the end or the welfare of others, and therefore that man must live for his own sake, neither sacrificing himself to others or sacrificing others to himself. To live for one's own sake means that the achievement of his own happiness is a man's highest moral purpose. So theories that dominate the latter part of the 20th century, and we are living in now, these are theories that are very dominant today, <coughs> such as Richard Dawkins' The Selfish Gene perpetuates this myth that humans are ends in themselves. But walking takes away any capacity for humans at all to make meaningful transformations in their lives, writing. We are all survival machines, robot vehicles blindly programmed to preserve the selfish molecules we know as genes. So individualism emerges out of humanism, a disparate set of political and cultural philosophies that emerge around the start of the 17th century and known collectively as the Enlightenment. Individualism promoting the idea that man was an author of his own destiny and it encouraged the development of science and technology as a rational alternative to the rational, theological, and monarchical worldview. An important thinker in the Enlightenment was Rene Descartes, uh, who in his discourse on methods said, I think, therefore I am. And all could be known about one's own internal experience, disconnected once again from others. He also proposed that bodies, animals, and machines were on a par, while the mind was transcendent. In the 1980s, individualism became bound up with neoliberalism and consumerism, and sociologists have noted a pattern of retreat from forms of association. In Japan, for instance, the individuating isolation of neoliberal modernity is affecting adult men. A growing proportion of men are experiencing difficulties with intimacy. This has led to a growth of dolls and computational avatars such as Gatebox, a virtual home robot. Gatebox features a blue-haired pixie 
So buyers of this can project what kind of anime figure they like. Um, who is a 3D anime character called Azumi Hikari? The production of Gatebox reproduces the master slave narrative quite explicitly. Uh, the virtual female avatar refers to her owner as master while she is a slave. In the early 2000s, Japanese politicians began to notice a severe crisis in society, a decline of marriage, combined with an aging population. What is more, more worrying is this technological individuating and isolating impacts are creating a significant minority of young men who have withdrawn from dating. They focus on online porn, like Nintendo's Love Plus, in which players conduct a relationship with an anime girlfriend. So in response to this kind of humanism, which might be all familiar from all your uh, texts, there is another problem that I foresee that needs to be addressed. In response to the humanism in the Enlightenment, there was an attack on individualism, uh, sorry, there was an attack on the Enlightenment, and these promoted philosophies of anti-humanism. These ideas were articulated in the work of Donna Haraway and an essay, A Cyborg Manifesto. While the Enlightenment was promoted as a period of human progress, authors such as Haraway pointed to the Enlightenment ideas uh, to, that were used to justify colonialism, patriarchy, racism, and militarism. But instead, Haraway and others attacked Enlightenment humanism. Um, for example, the U.S. Founding Fathers signed the Declaration of Independence on July the 4th, 1776. The new political franchise excluded black men, working men, and women, and it took dozens of amendments to broaden the political franchise uh, to include more human beings. Haraway and Latour, in their work, didn't campaign, uh, well, I wasn't say about Haraway, but certainly, um, the essence of uh, actor network theory has not been to campaign for the extension of human rights, extend the franchise to include artifacts, to include forms of property. These theories tend to downplay the human, even openly promoting anti-humanism, and sit comfortably with a vision promoted by techno-utopianism that breaks down distinctions between humans, animals, and machines. And I agree with Teresa, we shouldn't need a whole different debate about animals because um, part of the Cartesian dualism was it created this idea that human um, machines, sorry, animals were um, forms of property. But I'm, I'm gonna, I've written a paper about that. If you want to read it, it's an AI in society, but I'm not going to address the issue of animals here. I'm just gonna look at humans and uh, artifacts. AI and robots. So Tim Berners-Lee, for example, was an architect of this new model of um, internet, interconnected networks and systems that are integral to the flat ontology of Haraway and Latour. Tim Berners-Lee, founder of the World Wide Web, initially designed a software program called Enquire, which stood for everything with Enquire within upon everything. Berners-Lee was driven by an interest in connections between different entities while a researcher at CERN in Switzerland. In a chapter titled Tangles, Link Links and Webs, Berners-Lee explains his interest that foregrounded his research into web systems. This is what he says. <clears throat> in, an ex in, the, in an extreme view, the world can be only seen as connections and nothing else. Little else to meaning. The structure is everything. There are billions of neurons in our brain, but what are the neurons? Just cells. The brains have no knowledge until connections are made between neurons. All that we know, all that we are, comes from our neurons and the way that they are connected. So the model of the World Wide Web, clue is in the term web, <laughs> captures this outlook that we are basically uh, in a sea of in endless interconnectivity, a horizontal landscape in which intersections or partial connections are created. The cyborg is integral to Silicon Valley's vision of technology 
that humans and machines are interchangeable with each other. This history is important as it locates sex robots as relational others in the context of two simultaneous processes. One process is about an attack on the individual and people promoting the idea of the individual as disconnected and autonomous and separate. And another group who are saying, no, everything is connected with everything else. We're all interspecies. There are no distinctions between humans, animals, and things. Um, so as, at the start of the digitally network society, new technologies were envisaged to bring people together online. In the early days of online interaction, face-to-face -face interaction was still presented as a privileged form of interaction <laughs> that could not be replicated by machine-mediated communication. Uh, but what happened was that um, human-machine interaction was, com was increasingly elevated and equated in value and importance as face-to-face -face interaction. <laughs> so we've moved on from that because, you know, we entered the, st the stage where we have these um, uh, di digital universes that we enter into, you know, you can buy property in these uh, universes. I mean, that was a breakthrough in itself uh, in Second Life, just like you can buy property in the real world. Um, now you have face-to-face -face interaction, but a whole swathe of uh, advocates were saying, no, no, online interaction, if you communicate online with people, that's gonna be just as good, it's just as valid, and it's just as important as face-to-face. -face. So that was also enacted. And then what came next seemed very, um, I guess in the early 2000s, we, st we were starting to see the origin of that with the social robot. Because what comes next out of that is that a person, uh, a relationship, someone who you have a relationship with in your life, a meaningful relationship, can be substituted. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to have just a little detour here into individualism to show how uh, rather than modern individualism make a radical separation from slavery, what happened was is it incorporated some of these ideas with, within slavery into this modern uh, neo-political system, this political economic system we're now living in. So <clears throat> back to Aristotle. The works of the ancient Greek philosopher have held an important place in the philosophy of technology, particularly his ideas about tools and their uses. <clears throat> as I said, uh, many academics will talk freely about Aristotle as the, uh, as the father of virtue, while simultaneously ignoring how he wrote about slaves and women and children. I don't do that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, out of the kind of reaction to slavery became a whole range of different political philosophies that emerged in the 17th century uh, around the Enlightenment and individualism. And these are ideas that we developed and are central to our modern liberal legal systems. Uh, there's a wonderful book that I recommend called Our Person's Property by uh, Davis and Lafie. It's absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> Indeed, the idea that persons are all now free and equal is supposed to be fundamental to modern liberal legal systems. The free person is not only the basic legal unit, but also the very reason for our existence and our law. In Western liberal legal systems, it is illegal for one person to own another or to commodify a person in this manner. Modern liberal legal systems regard themselves as a radical break from the past, such as the time of Aristotle. And advocate, um, moreover, during the, Russia, the American uh, signing of the Declaration of Independence, it wrote, all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, Governments that are instituted among men derive their powers uh, from the consent of the government. And while this is written in this constitution, we all know that the signatures of the declaration, such as Thomas Jefferson, owned hundreds of African-American slaves. The political franchise described above 
did not include all men and included no women at all. In the US, black people were excluded from the body politic, first through a constitutionally protected slave trade and then through a constitutionally protected segregation. Moreover, um, the idea that persons are somehow separate from property, even in legal, even in legal law, is very difficult to maintain those true distinctions. So one of the problems is that embedded in the idea of the person is an idea of property. And it was really John Locke who very openly railed against slavery. And he said, um, we're not property, right? You can't own another person with property, but there's something you can do. You can, you can own yourself as a form of property. So you can sell yourself as, you can sell your labor, but you can't get owned by another. This was known as possessive individualism. And as a result, Western uh, ideas of the individual as a, as a person is deeply imbued with the idea of property. To be a person is to be a proprietor also of property, the property of oneself. Now, central to the belief systems of libertarianism is to promote political regimes that allow the person to dispose of the body as they will. In fact, many of these ideas were central to the arguments of the commercial sex trade. The global prostitution industry has grown hugely in connaissance with greater tolerance of more liberal legal frameworks, such as legalizing brothels in many countries. In the last decade, national sex industries and the international sex trade has experienced startling growth and profit levels. And this is extraordinary. One figure puts the annual turnover cost of the prostitution, this is just prostitution, at $186 billion per year. In the commercial sex trade, the renting, sale, and trafficking of bodies to supply an increasing demand is driven by neoliberal and commercial markets and rests on the idea that while not believing the whole person can be owned, because that is known as slavery, um, you can own, you can have access to their body and you can trade your body. So moreover, as Kat Banyard has argued in her book on, called Pimp State, the use of state institutions of politics and law has led to the legalization and the commercial trade in human bodies in the heartlands of Europe and North America. In the state of Nevada, for example, where there is some legal prostitution, there are over 28 brothels, and those are the ones that we know about. Billionaire and free market libertarian George Soros is known to have funded sex worker campaigns. During the recent debate in Ireland on the laws of prostitution, Soros funded the lobby group Sex Workers Alliance Ireland, who campaigned to liberalize the laws on prostitution. As activists point out, this alliance is funded by a billionaire. Philosopher Immanuel Kent was concerned about the idea of people as property. And he was actually one of the Enlightenment thinkers who was criticizing this idea of possessive individualism. Man cannot dispose over himself because he is not a thing. He is not his own property. To say that would be self-contradictory, contradictory. insofar as he is a person. He is a subject in ownership of things that can be vested, but not of his own property. Sorry, not in his own body as property. Inherent in the idea of the modern individualism allows for parts of the person's person to be treated as though they were property. And the philosopher Descartes also contributes to carving up the human into a body on the one hand, that can be traded as property, and the mind on the other, which was transcendent and couldn't be traded as property. Although, if you look at the goals of AI, you know, that is, um, I guess, central to their, their goals in a way, that you can actually uh, create an artificial mind and trade on it. <clears throat> so, in the 17th century, separating out the body from the mind was a compromise. It allowed the new wealthy elites to carry on exploiting human beings without having a system of slavery and ownership over another. So two of them coincidentally occurred. Um, so possessive individualism 
is an outcome of slavery, and it's inherent in our political systems. <clears throat> Right, I've got a lot more about slavery, but <laughs> yes, okay. I just want to make a few concluding remarks on that. Um, there is certainly this idea that um, in both the idea of the individual, if you're an Enlightenment individualist or a neoliberalist, the idea that people can become property, that they can turn their bodies into property is central to that. But on the other side, the kind of uh, liberal, I, I guess, um, more liberal idea that everything is connected, that we're all connected, that there's no distinctions between people, animals, machines, or other forms of property, also is a very dangerous idea because it takes away a species specific uniqueness that is actually integral to every living being. And moreover, it's an idea that sits very comfortably with a neoliberal techno utopian worldview that also want to um, think about new ways to make use of these ideas to create new kinds of markets of exploitation. So I did a diagram, masters and slaves. If you go back to this, the book, I really recommend it. Um, uh, there is a whole way of looking at post-humanism within this framework as a way to commercially exploit human beings, which is why it's problematic. But I just want to end by talking about relationship, because I've spent a lot of time talking about what, what I don't think relationship is, and when you can relate to others, not as living beings, not through a co-experience, not acknowledging another as an I or a you, um, or as a member of a species, but as a form of property. In my own work, once again, I was studying, in relation to my autism work, uh, attachment and attachment theory. And we know from the way in which human beings make their relationships, it does matter actually how we have relationships with other human beings. It, there, there is uh, ample research available that shows that if you harm human beings, um, and some of the studies have been done in childhood trauma and adult trauma, if you harm human beings and you treat them like objects and you expose them to violence on them, they are harmed through these processes and practices. And so um, at the bottom here, I don't know if you know about Harry Harlow who did experiments on, on monkeys, but it's to test um, if these uh, monkeys would be distressed uh, by being separated from their species he locked them in cages and then um, did experiments on them. So here's one example of this kind of artificial idea. So uh, the monkeys are separated from their mothers soon after birth, and then in the experiment, they're released into this cage every day. <laughs> the, uh, the, the wire monkey on the left is made of wire, but it has food attached to it. The uh, substitute wire monkey on the right doesn't have any food attached to it, just has this soft covering. And what he found was the monkey would go immediately to get some food on the being released and then spend the rest of the day clinging on to the wire covered, uh, the soft covered monkey. And the thing about this is some people use this, right? Some people are using this now as an evidence, as evidence for why, it's, why you can attach to an artificial mother. I've read this already. And they're trying to turn something which was horrific, right, was horrific for these uh, young monkeys into something uh, that they can make use of commercially. Because if they can make a case for it not harming animals, then we can make cases for it not harming human beings. And actually the monkeys were extremely distressed. They were, they had difficulties mating, they self-harmed, um, they couldn't socially interact. They couldn't actually be members of their own species. They were very much like, you know, the kind of trauma experience when you put children into domestic violence situations, sexual abuse situations, war situations. These are very traumatic environments for human beings. And I think the fact that these still exist shows that there is something wrong with our culture 
and how we're thinking about human relationship. So I'm just going to conclude, conclude on what I what I say because I like to think I'm not inside any of those traditions. I'm not inside the possessive individualism because I reject the idea that people can be parts of property and they shouldn't be ever uh, considered as property. But I'm not inside the tradition of everything is connected either because I do think species are different from each other and they need different, have different needs and wants. I can't meet the needs of a bee just like a bee couldn't meet my needs and wants, right? So recognizing our radical difference is actually a very good thing and also uh, enables us to respect otherness. So finally, in my own work, I draw on the, uh, the theories of psychodramatist Caitlin Boyan and her work on, the, on understanding human relations. She suggests that the smallest social unit is not the individual, isolated and disconnected, nor is it, nor is it the smallest social unit, the holistic configuration of everything is connected to everything else, person, animals, robots, AI, technology, graphs, etc. often in systems or networks. In Boone's analysis, the smallest social unit is always a person plus their relationships, because none of us exist outside relationships at all. We wouldn't survive as infants, we wouldn't be here now, unless we have relationships with others. So the smallest social unit of any is person plus relationships. And I think starting from that position, that we are implicated in each other's lives and implicated in ways that make us different from forms of property, which are ways to commercially exploit human beings, I think we can start to create new kinds of narratives. There we go. Thank you very much.